Great, thank you, Sophie. So our next panelist is Laura Georgescu, presenting a paper called Material Traces of Cavendishian Fame. So Laura Georgescu teaches in the Department of History of Philosophy at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Most of her work has looked at the intersections between metaphysics and science, particularly in the context of 17th century English natural philosophers. She's been working on Cavendish on and off for the past couple of years, and has recently published a paper on self-knowledge and perception in Cavendish in the journal Early Science and Medicine. Her work on Cavendish is part of a larger project on the metaphysics of bodies and matter, which focuses on shifts in the understandings of priority relations between the properties of bodies. Today, Laura will be focusing on reasons for Cavendish's preoccupation with fame, reasons which go back to her materialism and her precarious standpoint as a female writer. Um, thank you very much, Olivia, and thank you all for having me. I'm really sorry about my voice. I have a non-COVID related cold, so I'm sorry if somehow I'm not, um, you can't hear me very well. Today I will be doing something which is not very typical of me, that is I will not be providing a PowerPoint, I will not uh, give a handout, and I will not argue for a claim. What I will do instead is just sort of give you some hints of some interesting ways of, I think, I hope, of thinking about Cavendish on fame. Along the way, I'll make claims that are going to be completely unsubstantiated, but I hope that at least they will incite some, or trigger some bit of thought, and maybe in the future someone will pick them up, or maybe I will be able at some point to develop them. With that being said, I'll start reading my text. So as we all know, Cavendish, is, Cavendish out unapologetically claims with absolutely no sign of humbleness that she desires to be famous. This actually makes sense. Fame is, according to her, that by which an individual secures their literal continuation in existence. The disintegration of your bodily figure is not the literal, literal end of your existence as long as you live on in fame in after memory, as she sometimes calls it. At least in Cavendish's early writings, not all creatures seem to enjoy this perk. Living in after memory is a distinctly human affair. In World's Olio, she makes the point straightforwardly. Dead men live in living men where beasts die without records of beasts. Adding that, I quote, those men that die in oblivion are beasts by nature. Notice how strong a claim this actually is. Men who die in oblivion are beasts by nature. The implications seem to me quite dramatic. Who will qualify as a human is not just a matter of some set of biological properties we might have or of our own specific form of rationality or of the presence of a soul. It is an achievement retrospective, retrospectively gained through fame. This makes living in others an essential property of whoever qualifies as human. Seen from this perspective, the striving for fame is something like a moral duty for everyone who aims to achieve humanity. If we take such considerations seriously, and there's a big if here, we gain new insights into how grave the injustices brought to women actually were in not allowing women to pursue fame, either in war, in politics, in writing, women were denied the right to achieve ultimately this form of humanity. No surprise then that Cavendish is adamant and unapologetic about the pursuit of fame. But how is fame supposed to work? What would it mean to continue to live in others? We might think the answer is straightforward in her case, authorial fame. But is it easy to attain authorship? Is it sufficient to frantically put words on paper, possibly in as many genres as you can experiment with so that you can make sure you maximize contagion in, of others' minds? In the preface uh, of the PPO, Cavendish makes the following plea, plea to her readers. I beseech my readers to be so charitable and just as not to bury my work in the monuments of other writers. But if they still bury them, let it be in their own dust or oblivion, for I had rather be forgotten than scrape acquaintance or insinuate myself into others' company. This isn't the only time she makes observations of this kind. She worries a lot about one's mind not being populated with the thoughts of others. 
she treats this possibility of one, as one of the pernicious effects of bookish learning and of acceptance of philosophical authority. Similarly, she self-declaratively approaches her place in the history of thought by obsessively signaling that and how she differs. She rarely, if ever, claims companionship with other idea, with others' ideas. If being the subject of an intellectual biography or having your name on the cover of a book or defending an authority in writing would be enough to secure fame, we'd expect less existential worry about not being confounded or collapsed into the lineage of someone else's thought. For Cavendish, to really have her eternal memory, there needs to be a distinctive Cavendishian trace involved in the process. Now, what would this be? Cavendish's materialism might be of help here. On her account, a friend lives, in, lives on in me after their bodily disappearance through the presence of a copy of their figure in me. This figure of my friend is not their geometrical outer figure, nor is the entire bundle of their actions and traits. I simply couldn't have patterned this friend as a whole. I've always patterned them by parts. And the pattern parts will often, often be specificities or idiosyncrasies that my sensitive matter picked out and that my rational matter combined with its own tincture. The figure of my friend is, it, is in me a copy, but a copy in which my friend's relevance to me, how they matter to me, play the role in how their fi this figure is presented. In the 1663 PPO edition, Cavendish notes that throughout the duration of an act of patterning, the senses are somehow in pleasure or in, plain, or in pain. When an object is directly presented to the senses, the senses are not neutral and objective detectors of the objects of sense, but the senses themselves are affected by the act of patterning. This affectation stops when the object is removed. But this stopping on removal doesn't apply to minds. Because the mind can reflect on the thought made out of the sensed object, a pleasurable or painful uh, thought can last beyond its presence, the, the presence of the object. And the act of reflection on a pleasurable thought is itself pleasurable. We have here a sign of, if Cavendish the writer is to attain fame, she has to incite something in the reader. A cold, mechanical, calculated, indifferent involvement with the texts would prevent her from living on in the minds of her readers. But this is of course insufficient and somewhat also intuitive. If Cavendish is to be famous, there have to be the distinctively genuine Cavendishian traces in her writing. In her protestations about fame, this is what she's actually looking for. The imaginative literary worlds are perhaps easily recorded as, their, as hers. But what do you do about philosophy? How does Cavendish attain a genuine Cavendishian philosophy? This is what she is after. Cavendish is also clear in how strong the impulse the striving to fame actually is. So strong, in fact, that it often makes one act imprudently, arrogantly, or worse, hubristically. The vicious control that humans want to exercise over the rest of nature is sometimes analyzed precisely in terms of ambition and hubris, the pernicious side effects of the natural and welcome strived to, uh, to fame. In the poem, The Poetry's Hasty Resolution, Cavendish's hasty act of publishing her poems in the name of authorial fame is confronted by a personified reason. Reason is dissatisfied with Cavendish's decision to publish an unpolished work because, as reason ultimately seems to observe, publication is insufficient. The same idea is carried further in the poem, The, uh, the Common Faith of Books. Writing a book of philosophy would be simply insufficient. Most books are anyway destined to perish in the vaults of libraries, she'll, she'll claim. Instead, Cavendish symbolizes attaining authorial fame with the work of a spider building a cobweb. What we make of this? Well, to Cavendish sense and reason have voluntary actions. Voluntary actions are free insofar as they are self actions. There is of course a lot of dispute over what this actually means. 
but for my purposes here, let's understand them as actions free from external constraints. Now, under Cavendish's account of occasional causes, in a strict sense, the actions of the effective parts, the creatures of natures, will ultimately be free of external constraint. So this, there is something more to these voluntary actions when compared with the occasioned or the patterned actions. What's more is that these voluntary actions are described as actions by rote. Now, one way to read this would be to put the emphasis on these voluntary actions by rote as actions done by custom, from habit, from memory, some sort of mechanical repetitions. But as Deborah Boyle also observes, I take it that for Cavendish, the more interesting and distinguishing factor is that voluntary actions by rote are actually done in the absence of anything external. The, they are voluntary actions because they are done without taking any copies of foreign objects. So both sensitive and rational matter enjoy such voluntary actions. Frequent examples of sensitive voluntary actions that Cavendish analyzes in detail are dreams, distempers, madness, etc. Rational voluntary actions, she gives examples, and there are many, conceptions, fancies, thoughts, imaginations. Actions in which rational matter moves independently of these sensitive motions will just qualify basically as voluntary actions. I would like to suggest that, however, unlike sensitive voluntary actions, some of, some, some of the rational voluntary actions can be reduced to the compounding of previously patterned figures. Some will turn out to be literal novelties. I cannot dream of an absolute novelty. Whatever I dream will, will end up being decomposable back to some copies of sensitive matter that you know, were patterned at some point from the outside. I am merely compounding such patterns in dreams. But I think Cavendish believes that I can rationally create a novelty. The rational matter can literally give birth to genuine, genuinely novel thoughts. Of course, the world most of the times will behave deterministically, but sometimes, there will be leaps through such rational new productions. The inchoate suggestion I'm trying to propose today, and it's very inchoate, is that through her commitment to an infinitely varied matter endowed with sense and reason, Cavendish is also trying to allow for a genuine creativity within rational matter. This is of course a mere suggestion, but one which could explain why, for instance, in the PPO, Cavendish claims that as bodies procreate, so the minds, uh, treating the process of rational creation as a procreation is informative in a sense. Each of us is of course the offspring of our parents, but none of us would consider ourselves as reducible to the set of inherited traits from our parents, nor do we take our being to be reducible to theirs. That is, we're not reducible to the patterns of other things. The same goes for these procreative thoughts, whichever they might be. A procreated thought is genuinely a novel thought and has its own being. As Cavendish puts it, the rational animal matter creates figures in the brain after its own invention. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to compare these voluntary actions of rational matter to cases of spontaneous generation in nature, maggots generated from cheese, stones in a bladder, and so on. Sometimes Cavendish suggests that spontaneous generation is a genuine possibility. A novel thought is the spontaneous generation of the mind. Such concepts, conceptions will also be authored. No one can have a genuine conception that belongs to someone else. After all, they are given birth in one's mental womb via one's own idiosyncratic way of fusing or composing thoughts. There will be a distinction between additions or subtractions of thoughts, processes she talks about in the PPO, and this fusing or composing, which will result in a new unity, or so I'm suggesting. If these suggestions are somewhat suggestible, this tells us something about Cavendishian fame. 
It can tell us what it takes to produce a material trace of yourself that has the possibility of living on after the disintegration of your body as yourself through thought. Any material trace, such as a book, is always going to be produced by the sensitive matter or with the help of sensitive matter, that is. But what occasions it can, be di can differ. When the production of some material thing is occasioned by the free actions of your rational matter, its material is the material trace of you. When it's occasioned by the pattern of some external thing or someone else's rational matter, it's material trace of something other than you. This is what I take to be going on, on when Cavendish requires fame to be obtained through specifically personal traces. A material trace of certain free actions of your rational matter is a material trace of you specifically. And through this trace, you will live on so long as it, it, your trace occasions thoughts in the minds of others. In this way, the spider web will grow. And maybe the remarks that she sometimes makes about the degrees of, of resistance of a spider web will be or can be likened to the systematicity of such a thought. If Cavendish managed to write books on the basis of a genuinely creative thought, and I, I'd say she did, then she left behind material traces specifically of herself. We now read those books and they occasion actions of our own rational and sensitive matter. In this way, Cavendish specifically lives on. Finding these genuine acts of creative thought and showing how they create cob cobwebs is how Cavendish thought our thought one is destined to avoid being buried in the monuments of other writers. Her materialism of sense and reason is tailored such that it allows for such infrequent cases of genuine creative thought. It is in this act of creative thought that she sought to find and receive praises for her natural wit. She frantically writes in the pursuit of these very infrequent instances of creativity. Thank you.